history 3394. Uh, last week uh, we finished World War I very quickly, uh, much more quickly than the war itself took. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the post-war, uh, uh, I'm sorry, about the uh, role of uh, democracy in the United States very quickly uh, during the war and then talk a little bit about the aftermath of the war, which we'll spend more time on. Anybody have any questions before we start about any of the stuff we went over last week? Okay. Um, the last thing I was talking about was this idea of democracy uh, at home during the war. And uh, I want to do more of that today. So, um, Very briefly, uh, remember Wilson says that this is a war to make the world safe for democracy. And he talks a lot about... Um, you know, uh, uh, the way the Germans are being very aggressive in Europe and how they're guilty of all kinds of atrocities. And uh, the word terrorism is actually used to describe uh, Germany. Um, and, you know, I said there were stories of them bayoneting babies and things like that. And within the government, there was a, an, a, an organization, the, the Committee on Public Information, a bureaucratic institution, uh, established which uh, would go out and make sure Americans were adequately patriotic. And, and Wilson gets Congress to pass the Espionage Act, which makes it illegal to even um, criticize, criticize him. He says, woe be to the man or to, to the group of men who stand in our way. And, you know, in connection with this, people are actually jailed for criticizing the war, the most famous of whom was Eugene Victor Debs, who was a socialist, a socialist candidate for president, in fact. And Debs, in a speech in Canton, Ohio, said, this is a war for rich people, and the sons of the working class should not fight. And because of that, he's actually jailed uh, under the uh, uh, Espionage uh, Act. So, uh, uh, and, you know, I talked about the anti-German sentiment and, uh, you know, beer, uh, um, I'm sorry, bratwurst becomes liberty sausage and, and cabbage, uh, uh, sauerkraut becomes liberty cabbage. So it's just this kind of silly stuff on one hand. It's kind of like freedom fries, you know, uh, as if that would offend the French, you know. I don't think they want to be associated with, uh, if you want to really offend the French, you know, add French names to them, you know, like French bowling or something like that. Probably get them more, far more upset than freedom fries would. So this is the same thing that goes on um, in World War I. Uh, in addition to that, and some of it's silly, some of it is far more serious. I mean, uh, lynch mobs and things like that. Uh, even more serious was, was continued attacks on African Americans during the war. A lot of blacks fought in World War I. Uh, the uh, army uh, actually, I think in terms of percentage, probably had the largest number of African Americans in it, almost 20% of the armed forces in World War I was African American. They had the worst jobs, kind of menial jobs. They were always commanded by white officers and the worst white officers. It was actually considered an insult to be given command of a, a black unit. So you had serious racial tensions then within the military uh, to begin with. Um, blacks fought admirably. They won service medals and so forth, but nonetheless, they were always secondary. Uh, at home, uh, racial tensions uh, remain, you know, quite uh, uh, difficult as well. A lot of African Americans believed Wilson's rhetoric. This is a war to make the world safer democracy. So they said, well, if, if he's going to fight for democracy in Europe, then, you know, we'll probably have democracy at home, too. And if you look at, like, the war for independence or the Civil War, you see similar dynamics among blacks, especially black soldiers. Uh, however, that wasn't the case. Within the United States, racial tensions remained, you know, very, very high level uh, throughout the war. There were uh, major blow-ups, the famous beach riots in Chicago. There were segregated beaches. And at uh, one point, uh, blacks and whites kind of cross over, and there's a major riot with 30 or 40 people dead. Uh, St. Louis had major riots, race riots at the time. Uh, Houston did. Is anybody familiar with the Houston episode? So one person, so few people are people. You know, go to school in Houston. There was actually a uh, a unit. I can't remember uh, what it was. An all-black unit sent here to um, oversee, kind of you know, provide protection for the construction of, I believe, a National Guard army or something like that. Doesn't matter. And a couple of these black soldiers got into run-ins with the local white cops, and the cops beat the hell out of them, just, you know, pummeled them really for no reason. And so this black unit had had enough, so it actually took arms and went downtown into downtown Houston and started shooting. And at the end of the melee, about 15 or 20 people were dead, uh, including four or five policemen. Uh, the aftermath of that led to court-martials of 50-some black soldiers and the hanging of about 13 black soldiers, no, no cops, no white people were um, uh, charged or convicted or, or anything like that. Um, the famous Houston Freedom Town riot. So this was really common lynchings where you just, a mob would take a black man and, you know, uh, mutilate him, beat him, hang him from a tree, remain uh, very constant throughout this period. Um, in fact, 10 blacks were lynched while in uniform. Uh, 
I mean, men who came home from World War I in uniform were lynched. So, uh, and Wilson doesn't speak out against this. Remember, Woodrow Wilson, as president, hails uh, Birth of a Nation. He said it was the greatest uh, a film he'd ever seen. What was, I forget, history come to life. What was the phrase he used to describe that? I, do you remember? I can't remember. Well, you know, living history on film or something like that. So Wilson comes out of this kind of racist background. And so when he says, woe be to the man or group of men who stand in our way, basically what he means is anybody who suggests that there are problems in the United States, that there are social ills that need to be corrected is somehow damaging the war effort. So if you say blacks in the U.S. need to be treated better, if this is a war for democracy, we need to be given democracy too, then you actually, rather than being a, a patriotic, loyal American, become an enemy of the administration because you're actually damaging the war effort. This is the way Wilson thinks. So that these lynchings and these attacks essentially go uh, unpunished uh, throughout this period. And this is something you're going to see in, in basically every war um, that the U.S. fights, this kind of need to coerce and control the home front and it's really vivid in World War I and we'll see it again um, after the war ends. So uh, I, you know, you really can't talk about this stuff without talking about that element that, you know, if this is a war to make the world safer democracy, what does that really mean? What is Wilson's conception of democracy? Does it mean uh, uh, equal opportunity and, and civil and human rights for blacks in the South? No, it doesn't. Does it mean uh, uh, equality and independence for Africans? No. Latin Americans, well, we know that and we'll learn more about it. Asians, no. So what is Wilson's conception of democracy? Meaning, yeah, meaning, take it a little further. I mean, it's, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a one-trick pony on some of this. I mean, I've been talking about this, huh? Well, it's white men, but, but, but more than that, what kind of white men? I mean, what, what is his conception of democracy? Landowners. Yeah, but what, are they, what does it mean? What Landowning men uh, venturing out into the world to make everybody uh, just like that. That's part of it. Clearly, there's that kind of missionary aspect to kind of make the world civilized. That's the term they often use, right? Make them white, make them Christian. But even more than that, what is democracy? Free trade. It's, it's free to have commercial intercourse with whomever you want at an advantage for a profit. Right? That sounds really cynical, but it's actually, I mean, if you go back, this is what they mean. When they talk about liberalism, when they talk about commercial liberty, when they talk about democracy, essentially what they're talking about is free and equal access to, to investment, to markets, to resources, to labor. All right. This is what democracy means. It doesn't mean blacks in Mississippi get to vote. It doesn't mean we're going to have equal punishment for whites who attack you know, blacks and lynch them. It doesn't mean anything like that. It certainly doesn't mean Africa is going to be independent. It doesn't mean Latin America is going to be sovereign. We have the Monroe Doctrine there and the, and the Roosevelt Corollary, right? So it doesn't mean any of that. What he's talking about is, and, and as I said last week, a lot of business schools teach this. It's, it's commercial liberty. It's this idea that we have free and open and equal access, the open door. Okay, so that's what Wilson means by democracy. All right, so this war to make the world safe for democracy essentially wants to make sure that the Germans don't win because the Germans would not have that kind of open and free commercial access. They would have controlled Central Europe and had a closed, remember that term I used last week, autarky, right? Okay, they would have had more of an autarkic system. That was the fear. This is the real enemy of capitalism, autarky far more than communism ever would be, all right? Because uh, c communism is very limited, yeah. Yeah, it's it, somebody, well, last week somebody, was it you? What, what? Uh, it's basically, uh, they close off all their borders and they only trade with themselves, they become completely self-sufficient. It's, it's, it's an, no, go ahead. They, they just, uh, they, they use their own products and won't trade out. It's, it's an attempt to become an economically self-reliant system. All right, which means that you don't have an open door. You try to, to, to survive uh, internally. You know, it's, it's basically fascism. It's basically fascism. All right, you don't have open markets. You don't have open access to materials. You don't trade freely without tariffs, without subsidies, without barriers or anything like that. You try to have a closed and reliant system. All right, and now this doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be within a geographic country. It can be an empire, right? Or it can be like, you know, in Germany is attempting to, in World War II, an even better example, in World War II, what Ger Germany attempts to take over Central, initially attempts to take over Central Europe, all these areas without any Germans in it. So that's autarky. And this is the real fear. 
because well, communism doesn't really even exist yet. We'll talk about that. But even when it does, you know, the Soviet Union is not an economically powerful country, and and in fact, it's not an autarkic country. It's communist, and it has this kind of a communist economy with the other countries of, of Eastern Europe after uh, 1945. So this is the real fear. All right, and so when Wilson says we're going to make the world safe for democracy, that's what he means, and this is why the U.S. intervenes. We talked about the situation last week with gold being sunk on ships, and in addition to that, the need to maintain gold convertibility because the U.S. has more gold than anybody else in the world. In addition to that, the U.S. trades billions of dollars, and more importantly, even has billions of dollars of loans outstanding. And if the Allies lose, what happens to those loans, right? So there's clearly this big, vast commercial stake, commercial liberty, if you want to use that phrase with it. So, and it succeeds. U.S. intervention is limited but very important, and the Allies win the war in 1918. And, as usual, winning the war is not as hard as trying to deal with what happens afterward. And so the post-war issues um, here become really critical. And that's what we're going to spend a, a fair amount of time talking about, if I can do this right. All right. After the war is over, the major powers, the victorious side, the, you know, the, the Americans, of course, the British, the French, the Italians, all go to Paris for a peace conference at a palace called Versailles. And they, there, they are going to kind of create the post-war world. And there are going to be three major issues they deal with. They deal with a lot of stuff, but there are three major issues we're going to talk about. The first is Russia, which we haven't mentioned yet and we'll get into. The second, probably the most important, is Germany. The third is the issue of collective security, which is manifested in Wilson's creation of a League of Nations, and we'll go over all that. First, Bolshevism. This is important. The United States and Russia were on the same side in World War I when it began in 1917. But Russia had been having problems for some time. There had been an abortive revolution in 1905, and there were a lot of groups trying to overthrow the government of Russia. What kind of government did Russia have at the time? Who was in charge? The Tsar. So it's this old, feudal, you know, horrible place. Uh, uh, most of the country is landless. It's incredibly poor. The war is incredibly unpopular. In addition to that, there are several groups trying to overthrow this regime, the Tsar's regime. Uh, two in particular. One succeeds in March of 1917. And this is a moderate group, okay, led by a man named Alexander Kerensky. I don't care if you know his name or not. Now, Kerensky takes over in March of 1917, and Wilson is thrilled because Kerensky says this old czarist dictatorship has to go. We have to create a better society. He starts talking about democracy. doesn't really mean a whole lot by it. And more importantly, Kerensky says, we will stay in the war and continue to fight for the Allies. So Wilson is happy because if you're fighting a war for democracy and the czar is on your side, it looks bad, right? It would be, you know, like, uh, well, you know, put, you know, pick one out of a hat. There are all kinds of examples like this. So Kerensky, Kerensky's successful, you know, ouster of the czar really looks good. However, um, Kerensky stays in power, you know, not even six months. Um, you know, a little over six months. Uh, continuing the attack was a second group, which ultimately was more powerful, and they were called the Bolsheviks. Okay, you all know who the Bolsheviks are, I'm assuming, right? What is their political ideology? The Bolsheviks? Communism. They are led by Vladimir Lenin and Trotsky and all the other guys. Huh? Well, I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, well, well, I mean, Germany, you know, clearly had an advantage in seeing, you know, them overthrown, but the Bolsheviks actually, I mean, they were the product of an internal situation. Their motto was peace, land, and bread. Peace meaning the war, let's get the war over. I mean, the Red Army, not the Red Army, the Russian Army at the time, was essentially going on strike. I mean, guys were just throwing their weapons down and leaving the front. So it was just horrible chaos. The level of desertions was incredible. They were just falling apart. Land, of course, means land redistribution. Take land from these massive, huge landholders and give it to the peasants, which we've talked about before. And bread meaning feed people. So with this motto of peace, land, and bread, soldiers are on strike. There's famine. All hell breaks loose. And finally, um, in November of 1917, the Bolsheviks take over. The Russian Revolution succeeds. And the Bolsheviks scared the hell out of the West. No one had ever seen anything like this. I mean, initially, 
they equate the Bolsheviks with like Satan, and you, you often see that imagery. Lenin's name is actually Vladimir, but he was often referred to in the West as Nikolai Lenin, Nikolai meaning like Satan, because they tried to give it this kind of mantle. Uh, the Bolsheviks nationalized banks. They took over the banks. They nationalized industry. They shut down the churches because the church had so much power over the state. Um, but more importantly than any of that, which really sealed the deal, the Bolsheviks pulled out of the war. They quit fighting. All right now, um, let me try to talk and think at the same time, which is always hard to do. Um, but uh, as you know, World War I was a two-front war, right? Uh, in the West, you know, you have this battle uh, raging in, um, here we go. Is it up there? All right. Um, you know, in the West, you have this battle, Germany against France and so forth. But then you had this major Eastern Front, which I haven't talked about at all. And this is actually where the war began, right? On August 1st, 1914. When Russia quits, what does that mean for Germany? What can Germany now do? They can take all these troops and focus on the West. They can take troops and move them, right? So when Russia quits the war, this infuriates Wilson in the West. Because now, instead of having Germany divided along two fronts, they have to fight uh, a, a far, a, a reinforced, a far more uh, strong uh, a German army in the West. All right. In addition to that, um, the Bolsheviks began to go into the archives and get all these secret treaties that the Tsarist government had made. You know, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Really, kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. And they started publishing them, which made the West look bad because the, the Tsar had made all these secret deals with everybody. So he's, you know, the, the Bolsheviks are revealing all this information. And then, worst of all, is they get together with the Germans and they start negotiating at a place called Breslatovsk. And the Russians, in order to get out of the war, because they had to get out of the war to deal with problems at home, the Bolsheviks give up a bunch of stuff to Germany. They give up a bunch of land. They give up a lot of the best agricultural land. So they have to get out of the war to deal with their problems internally. The two major problems in Russia are famine and civil war. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The U.S. actually intervenes to try to overthrow the Bolsheviks. It's a really, uh, a really futile expedition, but nonetheless, the Bolsheviks um, uh, are in power, they get out of the war, and Germany is the big winner in a sense. Germany is the beneficiary of it because not only do they, they uh, lose, you know, not have to fight on the Eastern Front again, but uh, um, they get a lot of, of the best land of Russia. They get something like um, 1.3 million square miles of Russian land. Ultimately, as a consequence of World War II, Russia will get, get that back. Now, so they go to Versailles. What happens? Well, Wilson doesn't want the Bolsheviks there. So even though Russia was on the winning side in the war, the Bolsheviks are not invited to Versailles and they're not there. So the, the, the overall policy is going to be non-recognition, okay, non-recognition, which means that in a sense, the Soviet Union doesn't exist. They're kind of in limbo, right? They're there, they're massive, there's you know, millions of people, but they're not really there. They don't really exist, which is kind of a, you know, a fiction, but nonetheless, this is what the U.S. does. So the Bolsheviks aren't invited to Versailles. In the meantime, the U.S. does its best to try to get rid of them. It tries an economic blockade. It tries selective food aid. The U.S. appoints a commissioner to head famine relief in Russia. Does anybody know who that was? Herbert Hoover, name you'll come up, you'll, you'll hear again, right? Herbert Hoover was the commissioner for famine relief in Russia. There was, in Russia, who's in charge? The Bolsheviks, right? There's a group of anti-Bolsheviks called White Russians. And these are kind of the old Tsarist people and some of the old Kerensky people. Hoover gives food to these anti-Bolshevik groups, but deliberately, intentionally keeps food away from Bolshevik strongholds. So the goal, not at all covert, is to starve out the Bolsheviks, to force them to surrender because they have no food. All right, this is, this is humanitarian relief, to, to feed your, the, you know, these, these anti-government forces and to starve out the Bolsheviks. Um, they actually send, uh, they, they support a, uh, kind of a, what was called a cordon sanitaire. They wanted to encircle uh, Russia with troops. Um, and finally, in June of 1918, Wilson actually sends 5,000 American troops to Siberia for an intervention. And he had all kinds of contrived reasons. I'm, you know, I want to help, you know, protect uh, these soldiers. I want to protect the railways. All kinds of stuff like that. Uh, it was a disaster. 
Um, 139 of them died, and all of them basically froze their butts off in Siberia. And in addition to that, if you're going to invade and overthrow a government, you probably should try to do it in Moscow rather than Siberia. But at any rate, um, in the long term, when you look back on it, it's, it's really a futile expedition. 5,000 troops is minimal. They're in Siberia. Uh, but the way the Russians interpreted it was huge. George Kennan. I, I don't think I've mentioned him yet, and we'll talk about him a lot. Famous diplomat, famous American policymaker. Kennedy later wrote a book about this, and he concluded that basically in the history of American foreign policy up to that time, n n so little uh, was accomplished and so much was potentially lost. Basically, Kennedy said, we could have maybe had decent relation, relations with the Soviet Union, but at the very beginning, we, by invading, by intervening, we lost that opportunity because the Russians resented that. I mean, you know, go around and just ask somebody on the street, you know, did the U.S. ever invade the Soviet Union? And everyone will say, no, of course not. Conversely, if you say, did the Soviet Union ever invade the U.S., a lot of people will say yes. I'd be surprised at the beginning of classes, uh, I'll often ask like basic questions like that. And what really surprised me is how many people will say that the Soviet Union used an atomic bomb against the United States, you know, stuff like that. So there's this amazing level of misinformation out there. But the U.S. actually intervened against the Bolsheviks in early 1918 when they had first taken over. And that, that was, you know, part of their historical uh, uh, memory. Uh, and none of that worked. So all this anti-Bolshevik resistance collapsed, and by the time they get to Versailles, the reality is, is the Bolsheviks are in power. And Wilson has to deal with it, but he doesn't really want to. Uh, the fallout from that will be that um, that's going to be a major problem all the way to World War II. The Bolsheviks, it's like the big, huge, you know, uh, gorilla in the corner that nobody wants to deal with. But they're there, they're a major power, they've consolidated power, all right? Um, second is the question of Germany, which ultimately is, is really, I think, probably the key one and really critical in, um, in uh, establishing World War II. The roots of World War II are evident in what happens here at Versailles, and so Versailles is really uh, important that way. There were two major um, approaches to Germany being uh, discussed um, at the time, neither of which, of course, I have up here. Oh, yes, I do. Reparations or reintegration? Open my eyes. Two major ideas. One, reparations. The other, reintegration. What are reparations? Payments. Payments. Okay, they're also called indemnities. Basically, the idea there is that Germany is to blame. And in fact, in the treaty, uh, uh, Clause 231 was called a war guilt clause, which said that Germany was responsible 100% for the war, okay? 100% responsible. As a result of that, because Germany was responsible, they have to make reparations for all the damage they committed, which means that if they blew up a village, they got to pay to rebuild it. If they blew up a, a building or a school or whatever, you know, if people were killed, you know, these are, these are our reparations, okay? So the British and the French want Germany to pay very, very heavy and harsh reparations. And what's the point of that? Part of it is to get reimbursed for what you've lost, but what's another? Well, but, but even more than that, think of it kind of more in a strategic, to keep them down, right? To demoralize and keep Germany down because Germany's invaded twice now, 1871 and 1914. So if you can, use these reparations to economically strangle Germany, then they're going to stay down, suppress, and they're not going to be able to come back uh, uh, at you. Okay, so that's one way of thinking. And most of the world wanted Germany crushed. They wanted these harsh reparations. But Woodrow Wilson, and somebody else who I'll mention in a minute, had a different vision, and that was reintegration. Now, what does that suggest, reintegration? If you want to reintegrate something, you bring them back how? More um, open to commercial trading. Okay. Yeah, the idea to re is to reintegrate Germany commercially, right? To let them rebuild, to not crush them, to actually, you know, encourage their economic revitalization. And then, if Germany gets rebuilt economically and remains a democratic society, then how does that affect the rest of the countries of Europe or the United States? Stability. Open Stability, open door, economic partnership, right. So Wilson understands that America's economic health really depends upon Europe's economic health, and the key to European recovery is going to be Germany, all right? So that's reintegration. Now, the man in charge of financial matters, uh, whose name I don't think I have up here, at Versailles, uh, I'm forgetting a lot of stuff, man, was John Maynard Keynes. 
who I think I mentioned to you last week. <coughs> Keynes was put in charge of the reparations committee. And the Bank of England had suggested reparations uh, in the amount of $24 billion, all right? To give you some idea of what that's worth, at the time, I'm, I'm sorry, 24 billion pounds, not dollars, 24 billion pounds. At the time, um, a pound was worth $4.43. 24 billion pounds in 1919 would amount to about a trillion pounds today. In addition to that, a dollar in 1919 would amount to about $9 today. Right? So if 24 billion pounds was four dollars and, and a pound was four dollars and forty three cents, that's twenty four billion times four forty three, which is just let's say it's a hundred billion. Hundred billion dollars, okay, and then at today's rates that comes to a trillion trillion dollars, not a trillion pounds, I'm sorry. So, you know, imagine a war indemnity of one trillion dollars. That's nobody could recover from that. Nobody. That's that's a staggering amount of money. So this is the indemnity that the Bank of England comes up with. Does that actually reflect the damage that Germany caused? No. Basically what the Bank of England wants to do is get all this money from Germany in order to use it to repay debts and to rebuild its own economy. Right? John Maynard Keynes thinks these guys are insane. He said, he did actual, like, and Keynes is a brilliant economist, actually did the numbers, ran the numbers. He said the cost of the aggression was actually not 24 billion pounds, but about 4 billion pounds. More importantly, Germany's capacity to pay, and that's an important phrase, capacity to pay, what they could actually pay without actually falling apart was about $3 billion. So Keynes said the reparations payment should be in the range of 2 to 3 billion pounds. The Bank of England is saying 24 billion pounds, so this is a factor of 8 to 9, all right? Um, Keynes says, if Germany is milked, that's his term, if we milk Germany, they will be ruined. Woodrow Wilson says the same thing. If we push Germany too far, then they're going to resent us, they're going to hate this, and they will bring Bolshevism to power. And it'll be even worse. He was wrong. It wasn't Bolshevism, it was, it was Hitler, but he had the right idea. That if we crush them too far, there will be a backlash against them and they'll have some really horrible government take over. So Keynes is suggesting about a two to three billion pound, that's not dollar sign, okay, and the Bank of England is six, so there's a huge disparity there, right, I mean a factor of what, 8 to 12, okay, the Allies don't like Keynes's and Wilson's idea, why is that? Because Britain and France, how did they pay for the war? They borrowed from they borrowed heavily from the United States. In addition to that, they were loaning money out to smaller European nations. They were afraid that they would be left with bad debts in Europe, countries who could not pay them back, and in addition to that, massive obligations to the United States. Because the, when the war began, the U.S. was in debt to Europe. When the war ended, the U.S. was a creditor of $11 billion. So the center of global power, financial power, changes from London to, to Wall Street as a result of, of World War I. So John Maynard Keynes says, we need a, a, a grand scheme for the rehabilitation of Europe. Keynes isn't thinking, I mean, these guys are kind of thinking in, in small ways, Germany, so on and so forth. Keynes is thinking in European-wide ways. Keynes, in a lot of ways, is kind of the, the father of glo modern globalization. I mean, if you look at the kind of stuff people like Clinton did, uh, it's very, very much in line with the type of stuff Keynes was suggesting. He actually suggested a free trade area of Europe back in, like, 1919. Keynes' solution was very, very simple. Debts should be reduced and credit should be revised. Meaning, if countries cannot pay these debts, then to force them to do so will only drive them into deeper economic ruin. Keynes' idea was this. If we allow Europe, especially Germany, to recover without burdensome outside pressures, then they will provide a market right? So the United States will be assured of export markets if Europe recovers because where's Europe going to buy stuff from? From America. Where's America going to sell stuff? To Europe. In addition to that, if Germany can recover to some extent, they can feed their people. They can start to rebuild everything that was wiped out during the war, 
So Keynes' solution is very simple. Keep Germany's reparations, and Wilson's too, keep Germany's reparations payments reasonably low in the two to three billion pound range. And in that way, their economy can recover. They can start exporting goods. The United States can buy those goods. In addition to that, the U.S. can export goods into Europe. They can trade in raw materials. They can use these areas for investment. And in that way, Germany will be able to rebuild and feed its people. And in that way, the British, the French, and the Americans will all have an economic partner to trade with. Yeah. So is that in place with the Marshall Plan? It, it's very, yeah. I mean, Keynes dies at the end of World War II, toward the end. But the kind of stuff he talked about, yeah, was, was very much what he had talked about in World War I. Yeah, definitely. All right, now this, you know, on the surface, this makes sense, right? You think, yeah, that sounds okay. You know, we'll take it easy on them, and then ultimately we get ours back. The Americans, uh, first Will, not Wilson, but once Wilson dies, I'm sorry, Wilson is, is defeated for re-election. He doesn't run for re-election. He's defeated. He's in really bad health. Uh, Harding wins. Harding dies after a very brief time in office. Uh, uh, and uh, Calvin Coolidge all said no, no way. Um, they said, absolutely not. They owe us this money. We want every penny. And John Maynard Keynes flipped. He went off and he wrote this very famous book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. Uh, Keynes said, I'm utterly worn out mentally and nervously and deeply disgusted, depressed and dismayed at the unjust and unwise proposals we have made to Germany. And it's not because he likes the Germans, it's because he sees that in the long run, the consequences, the title of the book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, in the long run, this attempt to crush Germany will end up wiping out Europe. And he was dead right. Okay? Keynes was talking about Germany's capacity to pay. He said, and, and this is kind of technical, but, but it's also, I mean, the point I think is fairly obvious. He said, Germany can't pay 24 billion pounds. He said, Germany's only means of paying was through an export surplus. How do you get extra money? By exports, right? Today, if the IMF goes into a country, the first thing that they force on them when they do structural adjustments is for them to have an export economy. Indonesia, a few years back, they basically made Indonesia wipe out all their forests and sell lumber because that's the only way you can really get foreign exchange, right? By selling stuff, by exporting stuff. So the only way that Germany could pay was through an export surplus. Now, pre-war, Germany's deficit was 74 million pounds. By reducing imports and increasing exports, Keynes said, Germany might be able to turn this 74 billion pound, million pound deficit into a 50 million pound surplus. Spread over 30 years, this would come to a capital sum of 1.7 billion pounds invested at 6% add a couple hundred million pounds for gold transfers and so forth. And the two billion pound figure is the maximum that Germany can pay. This is based on very optimistic estimations that Germany can turn a 74 million pound deficit into a 50 million pound surplus. These are very optimistic speculations. If that comes out, Germany can pay over a 30-year period. We're not talking about all at once. We're talking about a 30-year period. Germany can be expected to pay 2 billion pounds. The Bank of England is suggesting 24 billion. All right. So Keynes, as I said, is kind of doing this whole kind of European-wide analysis. He also suggests that the Allies cancel their debts to one another. Okay, why? Because that way they can use that money for trade instead, yeah. Uh, damages and so forth, I think it's in the two billion range. I don't have a precise figure, I'll look it up. But I think it's in the two billion range. I mean, and that's, you know, the indemnities are hard because actually, you know, everyone killed is supposed to be represented an economic figure. You know, buildings are destroyed and so forth. So, uh, um, uh, Keynes suggested that the actual assessment of damages was about four billion. So it's probably in that range. Okay. Now, what happens? Now, this is Keynes's idea, right? But the British and the French are saying no way, and then Coolidge and Harding are saying no way. So what happens? What is Keynes's prediction? It's, again, Woodrow Wilson said the same thing. Keynes says if we don't go along with this. If we don't give Germany a chance to rebuild and recover, this is what's going to happen. Vengeance, I dare predict, will not be limp. Nothing can delay for long the final civil war between the forces of reaction and the despairing convulsions of revolution, before which the horrors of the late German war will fade into nothing and will destroy whoever is the victim, victor, the civilization and progress of our generation. I mean, in kind of fancy words, what's Keynes saying is going to happen, 
just basically he's saying all hell is going to break loose because Germany will, uh, uh, the forces of reaction and the despairing convulsions of revolution. The old regime isn't going to want to pay this $24 billion. And so what's going to happen? They're going to try to hold on to power, but what's going to happen to everybody else? They're going to rise up. This is exactly what happened. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, it's easy to say, wow, what, an, what a brilliant prediction. On the other hand, Keynes wasn't the only one saying that. This, you didn't need really to be a genius to say this could turn ugly. And he, and he understood that. Um, uh, um, Keynes's book was quite famous. Uh, um, the the solution that the Bank of England, that the, that the British finally came up with, this, these massive reparations payments, which actually were ultimately set at 33 billion pounds, not even 24 billion, they actually went up to 33 billion. Um, give Hitler kind of, as he sees it, kind of an open open invitation to do what he wanted. Uh, Hitler was able to make great hay out of the Versailles settlement. You would often, I mean, you know, in, in the in the late 20s and 30s, I mean, the Germans were just appalled at what had happened in Versailles. And the, the reactionary wing, the right wing, was able to use this to great advantage. So that's really crucial to understand because the roots of World War II are, are evident right here. By choosing this harsh reparations path toward Germany, um, you know, the, the conflict of the 30s becomes almost inevitable. The global economic crisis of the 30s, which we'll talk about too. The, the, the global depression in large measure is a result of this. Okay, the key to global economic health, it's very simple. Key to global economic health is what? Trade. Okay? And, and I'll have a chart which I'll show later today or next time. Trade just falls to shreds. Between 1929 and 1933, global trade goes from about 3 billion to about 900 million. That's a third, less than a third. It's 30% of what it had been, precisely. So you have, in a four-year period, you're trading at only 30% of the level you had been trading four years earlier. I mean, can you imagine that, you know, and take that, that what's that going to do in terms of unemployment? Unemployment's going to go up. What's it going to do in terms of wages, all right? Imagine if you're, you know, even in any, any kind of business, and you're only doing 30% of your business that you were doing just a few years earlier. How's it going to affect you, okay? It's, it's going to be dramatic. Didn't, didn't the psychological uh, aspect of not paying the debts off really... Uh, cause American people to come isolations because they well, then, yeah, and we'll talk about that too. There's a lot to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the 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 aftermath of World War One. We'll spend some time on that. I mean, everyone had a bad taste. Everyone said, "What was that all about? This war for democracy? It was a disaster. Everything turned out badly." So yeah, there was a general revulsion at the whole thing. This general sense of malaise, you know, and it happened fairly quickly. I mean, I think you know what you're seeing today in in the summer of 2004 in Iraq is kind of similar in that this is kind of an abrupt shift from a war which just a year ago was wildly popular and now it's really you know very quickly people are starting to question it it normally takes longer than that but in world war one you saw it happen fairly quickly yeah so this is important stuff and we will revisit it you know and again i think we're at the point now where i don't have to say remember when i said back then but when we talk about the 30s and world war ii you know it'll be really apparent you know remember what happened at versailles well now you can see you know the chickens are coming home to roost the third the third um issue that was very important, which is the one that most people spend, I think when they talk about this, spend more time on. I, I don't because, um, just because I don't, is collective security. I don't because it didn't work. Collective security. This is Wilson's view. Wilson believed that one of the real causes of global conflict, especially in the, in the lead up to um, the first war, the Great War, was, was this system of alliances, right? Remember that the, the, the French and the Russians had an agreement, and then the British and the French had an agreement, and then the Germans and the Habsburgs had an agreement, and pretty soon they're all kind of sucked into war, right? So Wilson believed that what the world had to do was join together so that if a country acted aggressively, if it acted dangerously, then the other countries would join together to stop that country that it would be an international effort to stop wrongdoers, to stop evildoers. It's kind of like the League of Justice writ large, you know. Um, and this would be called the League of Nations. They would act collectively, so Wilson's conception was called collective security. It's very simple. So he wants to put together an institution called the League of Nations. All the countries in the world would be in the League of Nations. There would be a major standing security council with five permanent members. What's that sound like? It's the United Nations. That's what they do after World War II. What much of what you see happen in World War II and after is a direct result of the failures of World War I. Okay, you know, kind of like let's get it right this time. So um, Wilson's goal is collective security. If 
an evil doer, you know, if some country acts aggressively, if it is causing danger, if it is invading another country or doing something like that, then we will all join together collectively to stop that country. All right? This is Wilson's conception of the League of Nations. Now, where does Wilson run into trouble with this? When if no one spoke English, like, no one can understand each other from all different languages spoke. Well, they did have, they, I mean, in, in, at Versailles? Yeah, I think stuff, I, it was like, a, they were just treading water, they couldn't get much done in the beginning. Well, I mean, it, more than that, it was, it was really a different conception of the way the world should be structured. The Europeans kind of rolled their eyes when Wilson talked about collective security. They, the Europeans are used to balance of power, right? The British and French have alliances, and then they sign treaties. So th they've been doing it this way for years and years, and they, they were happy with that. And basically, after World War I, their conception is to um, uh, 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 join together to keep Germany crushed. I mean, the European conception of Germany is squish them, and, and they basically feel very strongly about that. Yeah. Get any support well, that, that's what I was kind of kind of gunning for. I mean, the Europeans roll their eyes, but they go along with it because they get what the, you know. Uh, uh, um, what well, was actually uh, Clemens? So when Wilson came up with 14 points, which was kind of like the conception of the League of Nations. We have these 14 ideas, and Clemens so said, you know, God gave us 10 commandments. We break all of those 14 points. You know, that's never going to work, but we'll see. But it was actually at home where Wilson runs into trouble. The Europeans agree to it. The Europeans join the League. I'm making a really long story really short because I don't think in the long term it's as critical because it, it didn't really work. Uh, Wilson comes home. Now, in order to join an international institution or to sign a treaty, who has to agree to that? Who has to vote on that? The Senate does. Okay? The Senate signs all treaties, and treaties have higher standing. That's the supreme law, actually. Of the, uh, treaties are binding, you know, because they're between sovereign states. So Wilson comes home, and he has to have the Senate agree to this treaty. But what happens? They turn it down. The man leading the charge against it was a senator from Massachusetts called Henry Cabot Lodge. And Henry Cabot Lodge was an old, wealthy, kind of Boston commercial, you know, wealthy guy. And Lodge and a bunch of the Republicans, Wilson was a Democrat, believed that um, the uh, treaty would limit America's sovereignty. Okay, this is a term you'll see time and again. What's that mean? Your ability to rule, ability to, for self-determination, your ability to make your own decisions. Now, the fear here is that if we are part of an international institution and this institution votes to do something, then we are obligated to do it. But what if we don't want to? You know? And they're afraid, you know, uh, uh, that uh, uh, what if some country decides to uh, bring us up on charges for the way we treat blacks in the South, right? What if, uh, you know, what if the African countries complain about being, you know, uh, uh, colonized and then American blacks get some kind of an idea like that? Uh, what about the Monroe Doctrine? What about the Latin Americans? And in fact, they get an exemption. Wilson goes to the other countries and he gets an exemption for the Monroe Doctrine. So Latin America is essentially exempt from all this. So the rest of the world, you know, is, has this system of collective security where they will be held accountable if they do something aggressive. But Wilson gets an exemption for Latin America. So, you know, because of the Monroe Doctrine, the U.S. is still allowed to kind of go in there and do what it wants. Okay? So this issue of sovereignty is really critical. In the long run, to make a long story short, Wilson wouldn't make the compromises that Lodge and the Republicans wanted, and they killed the League of Nations, which means that even though Wilson invented it, the U.S. never joined it. The League of Nations had no enforcement power. And so, as we'll see in the 1930s, when Germany and Italy and Japan are going off in their aggressive ways, taking over countries and invading and doing all kinds of stuff, the League of Nations can do nothing more than basically write reports and slap their hands and say, we're not going to, you know, bad, don't do that, stop, that kind of stuff, all right? So this is what happens at Versailles. The consequences of it are really incredibly important because they will lead directly to the crises of the 30s, economic and political, and directly to World War II. All right? Any questions on that? Very briefly, what's the fallout at home? Okay. The war, you, you, know, you asked me that earlier, the war leaves a really sour taste in pretty much everybody's mouth. There's an incredible level of ennui and disillusionment. Huge suffering. Uh, uh, the number of dead was staggering, you know, compared to any previous war. Russia had almost two million killed. Germany, about two million killed. Britain, about one million killed. I believe in France, about a million killed. In France, half of all French men between the ages of 20 and 30 were dead. 
and that leads to you know incredible social consequences. Demographically, you have you know women never never marrying, never having children. The number the child you know the rate of childbirth going going way down for a time and so forth. In addition to this. World War I involved all, all of society. It wasn't, you know, kind of a chivalrous war. Uh, the landscape was devastated. New implements of destruction like tanks and planes, poison gas, mustard gas were all used. So it really brings in, you know, uh, uh, the level of civilian casualties is staggering. At the outset of the 20th century in warfare, one could assume that about 90% of the people killed in war would be soldiers and about 10% civilians. By the end of the 20th century, those numbers are actually reversed. And now in warfare, about 90% killed are civilian and only about 10% killed are, uh, are soldiers. And if you look at the most recent you know, conflict in, in Iraq or uh, um, Kosovo or you know, uh, uh, Chechnya, those numbers hold true where the vast number of people killed are not combatants. Um, in the United States, there was a widespread revulsion against the war and, and the disaster at Versailles. Uh, you see this uh, uh, in literature. Um, you see this in poetry, in popular culture. Um, novels like All Quiet on the Western Front come over to the United States and uh, people read them. Uh, uh, the War Poetry of Wilfred Owen. I, f I should have brought some Owen to read. It's really beautiful stuff. Um, you know, is, is very popular. Owen's uh, uh, most famous poem is, um, uh, what is it? Dolce decorum es pro patria more. Is that it? The sweetest thing is to die for one's country. And Wilfred, I mean, this is a time of great, you know, kind of like to die for one's country is beautiful and noble. It's a time of great patriotism. And, and Owen's last line is that that's the biggest lie of all. You know, the sweetest thing is to die for one's country. Um, Shell shock is very common. You know, today how we hear of PTSD with Vietnam vets, post-traumatic stress disorder. Exact same thing after World War I, except they called it shell shock, where men would come home and they'd have, like, you know, they'd be nervous. They'd have uh, nightmares and cold sweats. And, you know, after being in this incredible trench warfare where people next to you are dying and it's just horrific. And then, you know, it's really hard to kind of overcome that and readjust to, uh, to civilian life. Uh, there's an economic downturn, so there's large levels of unemployment. Um, you know, people like uh, Hemingway and others are writing about this, maybe best summed up by F. Scott Fitzgerald, who said that uh, after World War I, a generation woke up to find all wars fought, all gods dead, all faith in man shaken. So there's this real sense of disillusion. The kind, and who's to blame for that? Who gets blamed for that? Do people step back and say, our government lied to us? Well, you get some of that, but for the most part, you look for scapegoats, don't you? So who are scapegoats? Well, the Germans, blacks, but even more now radicals. See, the Russian Revolution had a huge impact on the world. A lot of people saw it and were horrified, but a lot of people saw it and said, hey, that's a good idea. So you see throughout the world, including in the United States, kind of a resurgence or an explosion or a resurgence in leftist parties. And in the U.S., you start to have communist parties and socialist parties and unions and so forth. Um, never a huge amount, but enough to kind of get some attention. So... Uh, um, now, all of a sudden, uh, when Americans say, why did everything turn out so badly? The answer is because communists. The communists are coming into our society and they're subverting us. Substitute communists with terrorists and you have kind of 21st century rhetoric, right? The terrorists are here and we have to stop them. We have a sleeper cell and they're, they've got a dirty bomb. It's the exact same stuff that they were saying about communists in 1918 and 1919. They're taking over the unions and they're all going to go on strike and they're going to all rise up and they're going to take over the country, right? There's actually a good, Warren Beatty actually did a good movie on this. It was based on a journalist, John Reed, and it's called Reds. Anybody ever seen that? It's like three and a half hours long, but it's, it's really historically accurate. You know, ignore all the stuff about, you know, Christmas trees and puppy dogs, and the politics of it is really quite good. Um, so because of this fear of the communists, this zealous patriotism emerges in the U.S., and people are very angry, and, and, and they want an excuse. They want a reason, you know, why are things so bad? Why do I have shell shock? Why is the economy bad? Why was the war such a disaster? And so they blame the Reds, and this is the emergence of what we call the Red Scare, the first Red Scare, the second will be after World War II with McCarthyism. Um, and people are frightened and they want to blame somebody. They're looking for a scapegoat. We saw this, you know, if you've done early American history at Salem, right? Uh, 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 Massachusetts colony was falling apart. The Puritans had lost control of things. So who did they blame? Witches. Witches. 
This is the exact same thing. Things are falling apart and you need to find a scapegoat. Generally people don't you know, really look introspectively and say, wow, we screwed up and we didn't run things right now. They, they blame somebody else. So in this case, you blame Reds. Um, the Saturday Evening Post, which is a famous magazine, warned that there was a Russo, a Russian-German movement trying to dominate America. I mean, it, it, it got to the point where it was really quite ridiculous. I mean, there are a couple million people who call themselves communists and socialists, and they're going to come in and take over the country. Even more ridiculous is the idea that the Germans and Russians were going to do it, because which two countries were absolutely wiped out by World War I? It was Russia and Germany. The idea that they could somehow cross the Atlantic and take over America was ridiculous. But, but all these patriots, you know, these patriotic groups get established. They're kind of like today's militias. And they are teaching people Americanism, and they become quite popular. Uh, in the Department of Justice, a Bureau of Investigation is established with, and who's the head of the Bureau of Investigation? Anybody know? J. Edgar Hoover. It's his first gig. It's before it's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It was in the Department of Justice. And J. Edgar Hoover decides that this is a great issue, so he starts talking about communists and reds. And the Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, does. And the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer. Palmer conducts the so-called Palmer Raids, where he goes after people and starts arresting thousands of people, uh, accusing them of being, you know, like today, accusing somebody of being a terrorist. You accuse them of being a communist, accusing them of being a subversive, accuse them of being a terrorist. And they're deported or or arrested without charges. I mean, the, the Patriot Act today has important, you know, precursors from long ago. I mean, if you look at the rhetoric and the kind of national consciousness, it's really very, 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 very similar. All right. So this lasts for a few years after World War One, and it and, it, and it's a, it's a, it's an, a, a rationalization for all the problems for the aftermath of the war. We're going to blame these these communists for it. Uh, finally, it kind of fades out. It kind of fizzles, but uh, a lot of lives were kind of destroyed. It also kind of puts the the capstone on you know what was ultimately a, a really you know dreadful experience fighting in the war, uh, the situation at Versailles, dealing with the Bolsheviks, dealing with the reparations crisis. Um, uh, the failure of the League of Nations and, and the Red Scare at home. So this is really a, a period of, of great, great problems that, as I said, for the for the tenth time, is going to directly lead to uh, the problems that emerged in the 30s and in the origins of World War One. Okay. Anybody have any questions? No. Okay. Let's go to the next thing here. Yeah, right. All right. No questions on this? All right. Talk a little bit about Europe after Versailles. I'm going to try to go through this quickly, too. All right. Once the uh, the peace settlement is established and, and the, the, uh, the peace conference is over, the League of Nations is set up, Europe has to now kind of look inward and deal with the, the problems of the war. Uh, and the first problem is kind of a catastro catastrophic economies. I mean, just terrible. Uh, in fact, in Germany, the cost of the war equaled about two-thirds of the total national income of the pre-war years. So this is really a devastating economic problem. Um, this also, as I said before, marks a transformation in global economic power. Europe um, had uh, been a creditor prior to the war. The European governments had been, the central banks had been creditors. But because the cost of the war was so great, that shifts. Uh, Britain's debt to the U.S. The U.S. becomes a major creditor nation. <clears throat> Britain owes the U.S. $3.7 billion. France owes the U.S. $2 billion. Italy owes the U.S. a $1 billion. The Allied powers owe the U.S. over $7 billion. This is just for war loans. All right. When you include post-war loans, the total debt went to $11.7 billion. So the center of the global economy moves from London to Wall Street in this period. Politically, there are major shakeups too. We've already talked about Russia. Uh, the Bolsheviks, after the intervention, were able to uh, consolidate power. And they shook up the global political system. You know, they nationalized banks and so forth. Um, and so they are still there. They are a reality. Uh, 
we'll spend a lot of time talking about the Cold War and the kind of typical chronology says the Cold War gets started after World War II when the US and Russia break apart after being allies. In fact, I think the Cold War is kind of on already. It's from the beginning. I mean, there's clearly this, this, this non-recognition of the Soviet Union, this failure to, to you know, acknowledge that they even exist. And, and you know, the Soviet continues to, to, to take these measures which just alienate and shock the world. So there's really this really major antagonism. I think World War II is actually the aberration when they got along really well for four years because they were both against Hitler, all right? So uh, uh, clearly then you have this kind of economic shakeout and Russia remains kind of the global pariah. They're the bad boys of the global scene. Nobody wants anything to do with them, okay? What about Germany? Somebody have a question over here? Germany. Uh, Germany, remember, is wiped out at Versailles. Um, in addition to the reparations, which ultimately are over 30 billion, 30 billion, Germany is forced to return the region of Alsace-Lorraine back to France, which it had seized in 1871. Um, Britain is forced to give areas with Polish population in them back to Poland, notably the Danzig Corridor, which I'll talk about later. Yeah. From, the, from 1871. Um, in addition to having to pay reparations at Versailles, Germany had its army cut. It was limited to 100,000 officers and troops. So it was forced to demobilize down to 100,000 total personnel. Germany was allowed no aircraft, no tanks, no aggressive weapons. All the artillery, aircraft, and tanks that the Germans had was supposed to be handed over to the Allies. The German Navy was supposed to go to the British. Germany, however, scuttled most of the ships before that happened. Germany was allowed no submarines, and the Rhineland, next time I put up a map, I'll point that out. The Rhineland is the region that borders Germany and France. It's an industrial region, a very rich industrial region. That was to be uh, occupied and demilitarized. So Germany could not use that either for its resources or as a launching pad for an invasion of France. Okay? Exactly, exactly. Right. I mean, they, they've. Well, it gets worse because um, Germany was forced to assign war guilt. Uh, they have these major reparations payments, but they had to also give up their merchant marine, their commercial fleet one-fourth of their fishing fleet, much of their railroad stock, <clears throat> and for five years Germany was to annually build 200,000 tons of shipping to give to the Allies. In addition to that, it was supposed to make annual coal deliveries to France, Italy, and Belgium, and to pay all occupation costs in the Rhineland. In addition to that, you don't have to memorize all this, just this is a laundry list, because it gets to your point, you know. How do they rebuild when not only do they have to pay the reparations, but they have no means to do that. Uh, they have to make these coal payments, build shipping for the Allies. Uh, in addition to that, France gets economic control of the Saar region, which is a lot of coal and iron, and that would be administered by the League of Nations. At Versailles, the German delegation was kept isolated behind barbed wire, and they were kind of given a Luca Brazzi. Back to war against you, okay? And you know it's it's hard to have much sympathy for the Germans. It really was. It's pretty pretty violent government. But the Allies used every course of measure at their disposal against Germany. And the real issue is Keynes and in the long run, and they really. Seen like this and gone with the wind. Or was that Citizen Kane? So, what happens? After the war, um, Germany is facing this, this devastating situation. You know, massive um, debts and, you know, these reparations payments and it's lost control over its own economy. Uh, there's a great deal of resentment inside Germany. Um, a lot of the German people are really angry at their leaders who had been publicly optimistic about the war even as things were falling apart. Um, there are elections in Germany and um, uh, the left, one of the problems in Germany has, the left is very divided. Uh, they might have been able to kind of unify the socialist, the, the, the communist, and, and take on the right wing. However, they remain 
uh, divided uh, throughout this period. Uh, so into that, there's kind of a vacuum is my point. There's kind of a vacuum, political vacuum in Germany. And into that, the kind of old militarists finally emerge. Um, people on the right, the old military officers, the kind of landed class, uh, uh, some of the corporate types uh, want an obstructionist path. They believe that the best way to deal with Versailles is to obstruct it, to reject it, to be hard line. There was a, a German faction that wanted fulfillment, basically thinking that if we can meet some of these obligations, then maybe the Allies will eventually kind of relax things a little and we can be reintegrated into Europe. Uh, however, the right wing, which has the kind of political upper hand, and there's a bunch of give and take and up and down I'm not going to go into throughout this period, but the right wing wants to exert pressure against the Versailles settlement. And so the right wing in 1922 actually signs an agreement with the Bolsheviks, and they actually set up secret um, factories in Russia in order to start producing uh, uh, military goods and, and other uh, industrial uh, products. Um, the right wing gains more power in the 20s, and they begin to refuse to make coal and iron deliveries to France. Uh, French troops then moved into the Ruhr Valley. Essentially, the France moves into the Ruhr Valley. Germany is supposed to be producing material for the, uh, for the Allies. Uh, the French move into the Ruhr Valley, and what do the Germans do? They refuse to work. They engage in passive resistance right here. This is the, the Weimar Republic is the, the name of the German uh, government. Passive, the Germans refuse to work. How can you get our coal and how can you get our finished products if we don't do anything? So they, it's kind of like a sit down strike, passive resistance, okay? So, um, so what does Germany do? Germany is facing an even graver crisis, okay? They're not producing goods that they can use to pay off the Allies, but they're not producing goods they can use for export cash either, right? All right, unless you export goods, you don't have any currency coming in. So if you don't have any currency coming in, what's one solution to it? Print it, all right? And the Germans begin to do that. The printing presses just fly off you know, the handle. In 1914, a dollar was worth 4.2 marks. This is at the beginning of the war. By 1923, a dollar was worth 1,800 marks. By late 1923, I'm not making this up because I double checked it. I remember years ago when I wrote this, I double, triple checked it. By late 1923, a dollar was worth 4.2 trillion marks, All right? So you've gone in one year from 1,800 to 4.2 trillion, do the math. That's just staggering. Germany had no, they had no economy. They had no hard resources to back it up, certainly no gold. Uh, and they weren't exporting anything where they could get foreign currency to use against their own. So the only thing they can do is to print money. And, and, and prices are out of control. You can well imagine what this does. I mean, the economy is a mess. They eventually take all this money in, they burn it, and they create a new currency called a renton mark, which is, I believe, a trillion marks or something like that. But it's out of control. Now, in some areas, now politically, what's the effect of this? A total chaos, total it's crazy. In some areas, you have the left come to power. But in Bavaria, a group of rightists led by uh, Erich Ludendorff, who was, uh, uh, I think, one of the last chancellors during the war, and Adolf Hitler come into power. And as this chaos grows, um, everyone understands that, that Versailles has, has been a disaster. Something has to give. And the Americans finally come around and realize that too. And, the, the, and we'll get to that shortly. But the result will be that the U.S. comes up with a plan to try to assist Germany in rebuilding. It's going to be called the Dodge Plan. It's, it's not going to work because you can kind of figure it out already. All right? So that's Germany. Massive inflation because they cannot meet the obligations of Versailles and the country resents it so much that they quit trying. So the obstructionist, the right wing, is able to, you know, and this is, isn't this exactly what Keynes and Wilson said? It's exactly what Keynes and Wilson said. Marshal Folk, who, who was the French commander who actually accepted the German surrender in World War I, said this is a 20-year peace. You know, this is the most we could hope for. It was 1919, 1939, he was exactly right. So, I mean, this is exactly what Keynes and Wilson and others had anticipated, that the Germans will resent this so much that they'll refuse to abide by it and the whole economies are going to fall apart. And this is what we see happening. Okay, Italy. Talk a little bit about that. Italy during the war actually switched sides. I'm, I'm uh, 
proud to say as an Italian that they were on the winning side all the time in World War One and Two both. So, uh, but uh, um, I'm kidding about no. They actually were. I'm not, not terribly proud of that, obviously. Uh, uh, in Italy, there were there were major consequences to the war too. Uh, not as bad as Germany, but there was certainly serious inflation. Uh, in Italy, there was also a a. a um, uh, a significant left-wing movement. Italy was a little different. In most of Europe, the, the radicals were in the cities, but in Italy, they were actually in the countryside. They called it the Red Country, places you know, in, in southern Italy and Sicily and places like that. And there was a great tradition of socialism and anarchism. And a lot of peasants and agricultural workers actually began to simply take over and, and uh, occupy uh, lands that were not being farmed. Uh, but had belonged to the great landholders. They were essentially squatters. In cities and towns, you saw an increase in strikes. So uh, uh, by 1919, 1920, Italy really is in the grips of this kind of left-wing offensive. Um, and the police come out and they start to use the, their means to get rid of them. You start to have these pitched battles. Uh, workers and police are in fights and a lot of the factories shut down. <clears throat> so the socialists established an organized party, but so did the Catholic Church. All right? um, the real goal of the Catholics and the religious left is to contain, I'm sorry, and the religious parties is to contain the left. One of the real issues we're going to see throughout the 20s and 30s and certainly in the Cold War is going to be the containment of the left, the need to stop the left. And when we say left, you know what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, well, it's it's the power of, of culture and religion and education, where you tell people that you know, if you want to be a good Catholic and get communion and go to heaven, then you have to be anti-communist. It's like today you have them, you know, threatening John Kerry because he takes communion and he's pro-choice. So that's how they fought them on the grassroots level. They didn't actually use. Well, with Stalin's famous line, "How many divisions does the Pope have?" No, I mean, they don't have a military, but they have incredible. Well, they have a lot of money. They have, you know, I mean, if it, can you imagine an Italian politician pissing off the Vatican? I mean, you, you know, you wouldn't do that. I mean, the Vatican, you know, has incredible cultural power, and so it's essentially political, right? Um, so there's really this kind of upheaval in in Italy, and the 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 wealthy, the old regime, the people who run industry, who own land, they they're afraid by by this, these leftists, by these workers and these peasants. Okay, so they want to, they, they need to kind of regain control of Italy. And so who do they go to? Who do they go to for control, to regain control? Mussolini and the fascists, okay? The fascists are, are, are Mussolini's party. Uh, they're called fascists because their symbol is a fasci. You know what that is? The wheat. What the, that's that's all. Yeah, it's the, yeah, balled up wheat. It's called a fasci, so they're the fascists, okay? The fascists basically established their own militias, their paramilitary units, and they're mostly young people and out-of-war veterans. You know, why are you out of work? Why are things so bad? It's because of these crazy people. It's because of our government. It's because of the settlement. All right. So these fascists go in and they basically serve as hired guns. When there's a strike, they go in and beat the hell out of the guys on strike. They'll send their people in as scabs. They'll break up socialist demonstrations. They'll kill people. They'll beat people up. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group of thugs, right? So um, in October of 1922, the fascists actually enter government. Uh, they had been negotiating with central government to, to organize it. Mussolini actually sent paramilitary uh, uh, armies on. He was going to march on Rome. And at that point, um, the government and the king were willing to take on Mussolini, but then Mussolini had good propaganda and spread all these rumors about how big the fascist force was, so they bailed out. And Mussolini demands to be named prime minister, and he gets it. Okay, I'm making a long story short and missing a bunch of stuff, too. Uh, Mussolini um, formed a government, and there he was ruthless. He goes after the socialists. He goes after the left. He goes after the workers, the peasants, the syndicatos. Everybody liked that. Um, in 1924, 
uh, the fascists killed the most popular politician in Italy, a socialist named Giacomo Mariotti. And Mussolini at that point abandoned any pretense of having any kind of a parliamentary government and essentially takes over as a dictator. In 1929, the Vatican recognizes Mussolini as the official government of Italy and Mussolini recognizes Catholicism as the official state religion in the Lateran Treaty, which I think is up there. If not, it's not a big deal. All right. Mussolini is important because, again, when we get to the 30s, we'll see why that's important. He'll become an ally of Hitler. Mussolini is also important because of the economic system he established in Italy. He establishes something called the corporate state. Okay? Now, the corporate state, and I want to spend some time on this because it's, it's a little bit complicated, not terribly so, but I think it's important. I guess I've got to hold them down at the same time. Stupid. I feel like doing a Homer Simpson line here, but I can't think of one that's adequate. All right. The corporate state, this is kind of Mussolini's contrivance, and it's the same thing Hitler will do in Germany. All right. In it, he looks at the economy, and, and, and the old regime in Europe was based on kind of property ownership. It was bourgeois. So you had landholders, and you had, you know, these kind of incipient corporatists, but uh, uh, um, there wasn't any kind of real, you know, kind of planning or regulation. So what Mussolini does is get together these, all the, all the firms in a particular industry, okay, and the workers as well, and they form a corporation. So all the steel manufacturers come together, or all the, uh, you know, the, the weed farmers come together, and they form an entity, all right? They form these corporate committees, and in them, the bosses, the workers to a small extent, but unions aren't accepted. You don't have unions in this, keep that in mind. These are like official workers committees. They are the workers who are willing to work with the bosses. They're not socialists, the socialists have been crushed, the communists have been crushed, the hardcore syndicatos have been crushed. So these are workers willing to, to work with the man, right? So they form these committees with workers to some extent, but mostly the corporations and the government get together and they sit down and they say, okay, we're going to establish wages and working conditions and so forth. We're going to create these associations, these corporations, and then in that way the state gets to run the economy, right? But, but it doesn't run it in the sense like the socialists do, like the communists do in the Soviet Union. It's not nationalized. It's held in private, and these businessmen come to the state, and they work with the government, and they say, okay, we, we have to keep wages low. We have to keep them below this level. We need to maintain production at a certain level, but we can't go too high, because if we go too high, what happens? If you produce too much, what happens? Prices will go down. So within these corporations then, let's say steel, the steel manufacturers get together and they say, okay, we're going to set our wages at this level, we're going to set production at this level, you can produce this much, you can produce that much, you're going to have to lower your production, you're going to raise your production. And in that way, the state is kind of an umpire to all this. The state can arbitrate all this and say, yeah, that's good, that'll work. So the state essentially signs off on this and says, you know, you guys do that. As long as you stay within the parameters we've established, you can do what you want. This is the corporate state. All these decisions are binding. So if we set wages at this level and the workers don't like it, what recourse do they have? None. Strikes are banned. Unions are banned unless they're the official government accepted unions, which is a dynamic you see all over uh, at that time. Um, so this is the corporate state. Now, this works economically, and it's the same thing Hitler will do in Germany, and it, and it actually does lead to kind of an economic uh, uh, revival. And Mussolini is able to use it to great effect. He claims that the corporate state rescued Italy from communism. And so the banks, uh, the bankers love them, and the banks give the fascist money to stimulate the economy. Um, and, in, and, and that's when they signed the Lateran Treaty. In fact, the, uh, the Pope, Pius XI, said Mussolini was, quote, a man sent to us by providence. Okay. So by the late 20s then in Italy, you have kind of an economic revival. But politically, you have a, a strong fascist dictatorship, which is, is committing all kinds of repressions against the... Uh, the, uh, uh, the left. Now, uh, what's the U.S. policy at this time? I mean, I, we can figure that out. What's the U.S. approach toward Mussolini? What do they think of him? 
yeah, they love the guy, right? He's, he's stabilizing Italy. So the U.S. has a very uh, strong impression. Dave Schmitz, who's an author, has written, uh, thank God they're on our side, you know, goes into this. He also wrote a book on the U.S. and fascist Italy. But, you know, clearly the U.S. was not, you know, anti-Mussolini, you know, by any means. They thought, you know, that, that this guy was stabilizing Italy. And most important, the most important uh, uh, characteristic a politician can have is anti-communism. He's anti-communist, right? If he's against the communists, if he's going to keep them out of power, if he's going to keep them subdued and suppressed, then we can do some business with this guy. So Mussolini ain't so bad. I, growing up, man, my friend's grandparents thought Mussolini was great. You know, this is in like the 60s and 70s. I remember sitting there and they would be talking about how great Mussolini was. It was just, you know, really amazing to hear that. So um, uh, 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 that comes out of that idea. He stabilized Italy. He was a very strong leader. The Catholic Church loved him and he hated the communists. All right. So uh, the fact that he uses these thugs and these paramilitaries to kill people and to, you know, break up strikes and to beat the hell out of unions is just, you know, that's just. Yeah. They had to choose between they want strong leadership and a stable economy, or do they want their brother going off to some unknown jail in the middle of the night? Yes, uh, we talked about it um, last semester, a couple of semesters ago, in a political science class. Today, in today's Venezuela. No, so oh, okay. They say Hugo Chavez isn't sending people off to jails in the middle of the night, but um, at any rate, uh, um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of a dynamic that you see at play in many places, and we will talk more about that after your, your very brief break here, so.